possible for him to do that. That's good, ladies. She's talking about the, the, the ladies' retreat that, uh, that we just had here at Temple. And uh, I haven't talked to anybody since it happened, but obviously from her testimony, it was good. And I knew it would be. And I'm glad. How many of you ladies got to go to it? Good, good, good. That's good. It's good to get apart and refresh and renew your mind and spend time with spiritual things like that. That's a good thing. Amen. All right. I want you to turn with the Bible this morning, the book of Hebrews, if you would, please. Chapter number 1, verse 1 in one hand, and chapter number 2, and verse number 10 in the other. Hebrews chapter number 1, and verse number 1. The apostle said, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the, by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. In chapter number 2 and verse 10, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make, the note carefully, the captain of their salvation, perfect through sufferings. Father, bless your holy word now. In thy blessed name, amen. You can be seated. I'm going to call your attention to the statement, verse number 10, where it says, The captain of their salvation. The apostle that wrote the book of Hebrews had many descriptive terms that he uses in reference to our Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Hebrews is a book of comparisons. The book of Hebrews is a book of warnings. The book of Hebrews is also a book that encourages us to draw nigh to God, that he may draw nigh to us. The book of Hebrews defines faith for us in the 11th chapter. The book of Hebrews is unique in all the Bible, for it is a book that is a transitional book, but it also looks far into the future. For the top, the book of Hebrews talks about this high priest after the order of Melchizedek, whose priesthood is based not on a carnal commandment, but on an endless life. And so the book of Hebrews chapter number 2 and verse number 10 talks about the captain of our salvation. Not simply the term that we are saved, not simply that we are born again, and these are wonderful terms, but the scripture says that he's the captain of our salvation. And that's something when you begin to think about it, when you compare that with what it says in Hebrews chapter number 1. For we want to talk about, first of all, who he is. It says in Hebrews 1 that he is the very brightness of the glory of Almighty God. God Almighty is an invisible being, folks. There is an invisible spirit world that your natural eye could never see. If you were standing in the midst of heaven right now, if it were possible, and it's not, not in your flesh, but let's say you did. Let's say it was, let's say you were standing there in the land that is fairer than day, by faith we can see it afar. In that home of, the, home of the soul, in that place where God Almighty resides, you couldn't see a thing. For your natural eye cannot see it. You're not tuned to it. You have no ability to look into the invisible world. So when the Bible uses the term, the brightness of his glory, it simply means there is one who came from the invisible world. In the world where an eye cannot perceive. To you it would be nothing but outer darkness and emptiness. A light appears and shines brightly and focuses upon mankind. The light came from a land that you know nothing about save what the Bible has to say. He is the brightness of his glory. The apostle in Hebrews wants you to understand that the Lord Jesus Christ came so that God could reveal himself to you. The revelation of God is the Son of God. 
The understanding of God is the Son of God. The knowledge of God is the Son of God. The approach to God is the Son of God. We know nothing about God apart from His Son. The Lord Jesus Christ is the declaration of who God is. The second thing that it says here in chapter number 1 is that He is the express image of His person. That simply means that the Lord Jesus Christ is what God Almighty made available so we could comprehend who He was. We have to comprehend being human beings, a being with two arms and two legs, a creature that I am. In order for me to comprehend Almighty God, God Almighty must come down to where I am so that I can see Him in the flesh. And that's who Jesus Christ is. He's the very image of Almighty God. When God made Adam breathe in his nostrils the breath of life in the garden there and all the privileges a man could have, yet the Bible said Adam fell. And when he fell, he lost that image and he had a son. And the Bible said his son was born after his image and his likeness. The scripture wants you to understand that when Adam's uh, continued to bear, 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 and those who, who were born after him, they all bore in their own image, in their own likeness, because that likeness had been broken and had been shattered because of the fall of man. But when the Lord Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago into this world, he came as the very perfect image of Almighty God. Amen. Yeah. Nothing could be done to add to that. But when he came, he came as a man. And he came as a man incarnate in flesh. God incarnate in flesh. But there are two very important qualifying scriptures so that you'll understand what we're talking about. In the book of Hebrews 2 verse 14 it said, For as much then as the children are, partaker, children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. In Romans 8, 3, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Was the Lord Jesus Christ God incarnate? Absolutely. Was His flesh the flesh of God? Yes, sir. Well, for He had the very blood of God coursing through His veins. The Bible said He purchased the church of God with His own blood. The Lord Jesus Christ was the body of God, the flesh of God, God incarnate, and God Almighty's blood. In every sense of the word, the Lord Jesus Christ is God. He's not, he is not a lesser God. He's not, a, he's not, as Plato would say, a demigod. He is the very God of gods. And my friend, it needs to be understood that when he incarnated himself in flesh, his flesh could go to a cross and die. His flesh could go to a cross and bleed. His flesh could suffer and hunger like my flesh. But the big difference between the flesh of Christ and my flesh, he never was born under original sin, under the curse and condemnation of sin. A man, yes, but not a man like I'm a man that is cursed of God. That's the difference. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, that's who he is. He's God in flesh. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. If your Bible does not say that God was manifest in the flesh, get yourself a Bible that does say that. For the vast majority of all ancient manuscripts support 1 Timothy 3.16 that you've got in this book right here. God was manifest in the flesh. If you get a hold of that in your heart and in your soul and build your foundation on the simple truth that the Lord Jesus Christ is God Almighty, Revelation 1.8, then you'll never be sucked off into some cult that tries to diminish and belittle the person of Christ at His expense. Amen. My friend, not only who He is, but what did He do? In Hebrews chapter number 5 and verse 7, here's what it says. Who in the days of his flesh, when he'd offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became, note carefully, the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. That term, the author of eternal salvation, literally means he is the architect that designed the way in which you are saved, 
the way in which you live out your life of salvation and the consummation and fruition of a life lived in service to Him. Salvation, my friend, is not just one act. Salvation is a continuing thing throughout your lifetime. The new birth is one act. When you are born into the family of God, you become a son of God by the new birth, and that never changes. You have been begotten of God, but so many Christians take that as it and turn around and walk away from God, and they feel like He has no part in their ongoing life, which He is directly involved in. For the Bible said it is able to save them to the uttermost, seeing that He ever liveth to make intercession. This uttermost salvation means a complete salvation. That he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We stop short of what God is capable and able to do. Hebrews chapter number 2 and verse 10, For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. In Hebrews 12 verse 2 it said, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So the Bible said he's the author of eternal salvation. He's the captain of our salvation. And he's the author and finisher of our faith. You must understand that everything that relates to your faith from the moment that you're born again, from the very act of faith itself that saves you, until you draw your last breath on this earth, has already been designed by the captain, the author, the architect of your very salvation. That designing took place when he learned by suffering what it would take to get you saved and keep you saved until he called you forth from this world. There is absolutely nothing that a human being can go through that the Lord Jesus Christ has not experienced it and he has experienced it to its depths. In order for him to be the savior of all mankind, he must be able to save all mankind. If the Bible said by the grace of God he should taste death for every man, he tasted your death. He understood what it would be for you to die in the shape you're in. For the Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world into himself not imputing their trespasses unto them, and given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To it, my friend, and this is the to it, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The Lord Jesus Christ descended into a place that a human mind cannot conceive. When he prayed at the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. He was having unfolded for his very soul and for his very being all that would be part of salvation. The cross was the consummation. Gethsemane was the very entrance into the very hell that he would have to experience. The Lord Jesus Christ, my friend, was abandoned of God. At the cross at Calvary, he cried out and said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the reason God the Father forsook him is because the Lord Jesus Christ had become what was necessary for you to be born again. The Bible says in the book of Psalm chapter number 22, I am a worm and no man. God Almighty spoke from heaven and here's what he said to his son when he forsook him at the cross. From this point on, you must go through it alone. You will go through it alone. You will no longer have my strength. You will no longer have my faith. You will no longer have a contact with me. The heavens are going to be turned into blackness. The contact of the Holy Spirit will be cut. From this moment on, you will descend into what you descend into. And friend, he did. When he gave up his soul upon the cross and said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. For the next three days he suffered unspeakably. He suffered unspeakably because he was going through what you would go through. 
First of all, my friend, God Almighty rejected him as a man. For there he made him to be sin. There at the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ, everything had changed about him. For now he's become sin itself. That's so hard for us to understand. But the Bible said God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I think about the contrast of how Christ has made sin and how that I am made righteous. I am made righteous because of what he did for me. Amen. Hallelujah to God. I don't know if you can understand what I'm trying to say to you. He had to go it alone. He had to go it alone because God had forsaken him. Every fear, every doubt, every possible human emotion that could come upon us in this world. Everything that could detract us from God. Everything that could hinder our faith. Everything that could drag us down by the voice of the accuser. The Lord Jesus Christ tasted, endured, and overcame. Alone as a man. Alone as the personification of sin. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 said, For he hath made him to be sin. Can you understand how he felt? He had to feel it. He had to sense it. He had to know it. He had to understand it. There had been no sin to him. He had a sinless, perfect man. Everything he ever did in his life, he did it to please the Father. In absolute, complete obedience. The difference between him and me, I was born in sin. I wallowed in it. I drank its dregs dry. I delved deep into it. My friend, it was no shock to me to sin. Sin was my nature. I was born with Adam's sin. I was born a fallen creature. But the Lord Jesus Christ was pure and holy and humble and compassionate and separate from sinners. And all of a sudden, the sin of the whole world is heaped upon him. My, 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 my. If he's not able to save to the uttermost, there is none that can. If he was not prepared to be our great high priest and minister to us what we need, there's no other way. And my friend, not only that, not only that, alone as a man, alone as the personification of sin, but in Galatians chapter number 3 and verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Not only is he a man forsaken, not only is this personification of sin, but now on top of all of that, he is cursed from Almighty God. God Almighty put the curse of damnation upon his son. What more could he possibly have done? How low could he possibly have gone? How much more could he possibly have done to show you that he loved you, but to also for God to show you that he was going to break the back of sin? That he was going to take the scapegoat and carry it outside the camp. Yeah. That he was going to offer up the sin sacrifice that would be a sweet smelling savor in the nostrils of God. Amen. That however low that you get, however sorry you are in your condition, however depraved that your sin becomes, Christ tasted your death. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah to God. The church gets so sweet and so pretty and it smells so good and everybody acts so good when they come in and oh how sweet it is. But the truth of the matter is that we're fallen creatures and that we're not a soul in this house would want your life to be plastered on a screen for the world to see. I am so thankful that when Satan tries to plaster it up, the blood washes it away. Hallelujah. Amen. Satan would do everything he can to accuse you, condemn you, drag you down, and distort, the, and distort your vision of God and understanding of his relationship with you. If Satan can do that, he will do that. But Christ died for me according to the scriptures. And I stand on that at this hour. Hallelujah to God. How does he save? How does he save? How he saves? He is eminently qualified to save. There is no Savior like this Savior. He is a Savior. He is the Savior. He is the Savior of mankind. If you ever find yourself sinking into sin, wallowing in a place that you never thought you'd ever be, at the end of the rope, all the things and choices that you've made brought you to this point in life, and you look back over it and think, my, what a fool I've been, remember something. There is a name that is above every name. And at that name, every knee shall bow. 
every tongue shall confess that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. But it is also the name of the Savior. Say that name, Jesus. When you find yourself in that place, say the name of Jesus. Cry out to Jesus. Cry out to the Lamb of God. And he won't turn you away. If any man comes unto me, I will in no wise cast him out. You see, the Bible said, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, and canst not tell from whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit of the living God. Let's talk about that for a minute. I talked a little bit about it before, but let's talk about it this morning. Some of you have been to the altar a dozen times. You've been baptized in Jesus' name. You've been baptized in the Catholic Church. You've been baptized in the Presbyterian Church. You've been baptized as, as Church of Christ. You've been everywhere. You've tried everything. You've done it all. And you still have no hope and peace in your soul. Amen. Some of you rededicate, 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 rededicate. And you go right back to the same place you came from. For there's no peace or hope. In your soul, nothing is really changed. The wind bloweth where it listeth, thou hearest the sound thereof. Canst not tell from whence it cometh and whether it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Men will reduce it to a formula. Those in, the, in some churches, they'll reduce it to a formula. You prayed the sinner's prayer, you're okay. No, you're not okay. You're okay when you have peace and hope in your soul. You're okay when your sins have been washed away. You're okay when that burden of damnation is lifted from your heart. You're okay when the spiritual hunger starts building up inside you for something that you absolutely hated before, but now you love because you're a new pre creature in Christ Jesus. You're okay because you love Jesus. You're okay when the name of Jesus puts tingling in your heart. You're okay when the name of Jesus brings up something inside you that's warm and good. In the name of Jesus is where your hope is located, where your future is. The name of Jesus is what you're about. You're okay then. Nobody has to wave a hand across you. Nobody has to take you to a catechism class. Nobody has to perform or pronounce you anything. You're okay. But you see, the problem is that if you fall into the hands of men, men will manipulate you and merchandise you and make you part of their, car, their, their organization, their church, their denomination. I don't care anything about that garbage. It's Jesus in your heart. Do you know him? Do you know him? How he saves. Hebrews chapter number 7 verse 25, wherefore he's able to save to the uttermost them that come to God by, by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession. Complete salvation and intercession are intertwined. You can't separate them. You cannot separate them. 2 no. Corinthians 10, 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Let's get something understood here this morning. The new birth is that moment that Jesus comes into your heart. Wind bloweth where it listest, thou hearest the sound thereof. Canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. It is that place where you, you, not your neighbor, not your friend, not your daddy, not your mama, you come face to face with your maker. And you really take Jesus into your heart. That's the new birth. It may not be the same for you as it was for you. It may not happen the same way for you as it does for you. Some of you, it'll be a process to get you there. Some of you, it'll be an immediate thing when you come face to face and throw up your hands and say, I'm a piece of garbage. God help me and save me. And just like that, just like that, just like that, you fall to your knees and say, thank you, Jesus. I feel it's gone. Well, some of you try this religion, try that religion, go through this, go through that, go through this, go through that. Until you finally throw up your hands and say, Lord God, where are you? Isn't there some absolute truth somewhere? Didn't you die for me? I want to be saved. And then he gently, sweetly begins to lead you to Christ. Have you been, ever been led there? Not led to a system, not led to a man, not led to some man-made garbage but to Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Savior. Yeah. Yes, he is. Amen. Somebody believes, so many people say, well, I want to hear his testimony. I don't care about hearing his testimony. I want to see his testimony. There's too much talk. I care about hearing his testimony. 
Your testimony is the way you live. If you're a new creature in Christ Jesus, your life's going to change. Oh, it may not be as profound as the next guy. You may not be as wicked in some areas as someone else. You know, you may not be, you may not be doing some of these things that are the blatant sins. But you still need to be born again. And I don't care how subtle the change is. There'll be a change. There'll be a change. There'll be a change. That's when Christ comes in. And then the change gets greater as the work of salvation takes over. The new birth is an instantaneous event. Pinpointed to a place in time where you met Christ and he saved your soul and birthed you into the family of God. Let's get that settled. One time and once and for all and forever. But salvation just starts then because he's going to save your soul. One of the greatest battles that Christ had on this earth was the battle for his soul. Are you listening now? It was the battle for his soul. His enemy's well equipped. He's all so experienced. You can see the beginnings of that battle in the wilderness of 40 days. When Satan came to him, he didn't go to Satan, Satan came to him and started quoting scripture. Are you following me? He entered into his realm. He spoke on his level. He spoke on his terms. He came from the Bible quoting scripture. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, who wrote the book that he's quoting, quoted the Bible back to him, applied it, and made an application he could understand. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, the battle for your soul is what's going on here. This is not to get you saved. 2 Corinthians 10 is not talking about the new birth. Please understand that. John 3 says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. That's the new birth. He didn't even have a clue what he was talking about. But 2 Corinthians 10 is written to people who are already saved, born again. And what's it about then, preacher? It's about the saving of your soul, your life, your growth in the Lord. What's necessary to keep you going in your salvation? I see so many who quit. Here are the three things, and I'll come to a close after I cover them. Three things. Look at them carefully. Second Corinthians, he said, casting down imaginations. That word cast down is the Greek word kathairero. Kathairero. That word means, listen carefully now, casting down imaginations and every high thing. Well, what is that? An imagination is the unsaved dreamland that unsaved people live in. It's called filthy dreamers. You ever met anybody like that? They live in this world of music, entertainment, an occupation. It's dreamland. Anything but deal face to face with the reality, who they are, where they're going. That's the imaginations. High thing is the world of science and philosophy. Right? The world where science falsely so called contradicts the word of God. Real science never has contradicted the word of God. Philosophers Oh my, how they're supposed to look into the soul of a man. And they don't even know what they are. And yet there are those out there this day right now that all they base their whole existence and future on is what they believe science to be and philosophy to be. Then the third thing is bringing captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. A thought is something that just pops up in the mind. Pops up all of a sudden. Like a fiery dart from Satan like you've been praying one minute next minute all of a sudden you look here and you see something you shouldn't see and some old thing comes up in your soul and creates confusion with you so what do you do with them well here's what the Bible says to do with them in 2nd Corinthians chapter number 10 it said first of all with the imaginations and the high things you are to cast them down the word means to disassemble Think about it a minute. Think about it a minute. Imaginations and high things. All right. 
I'm going to take evolution, which is the backbone and basis of yeah. science, right. and I'm going to take it apart. Amen. I'm going to dissemble it, disassemble it. I'm literally going to go to its root, and I'm going to destroy it from the root up because it tries to destroy my faith. Does that apply to you, young people? Has your teacher with a degree looked down upon you and made you intimidated you with the idea that they know so much more than you do and trying to ram that stuff down your throat? God says, take it apart. Amen. And if you want some references, I'll give you plenty of references that take it apart. Amen. Philosophy, my goodness gracious, yeah. they don't even agree with each other. Yeah. Couldn't, not, are you kidding? Yeah. You got Spinoza on one hand, you got another one over here on this hand, you got this and this and that. They don't agree with each other. And you're going, to base your, you're going to base your life upon what some man says about looking into the human soul? Philosophy is to be disassembled. You say, well, preacher, don't, don't you believe in philosophy? The word itself is a lover of wisdom. Phileo, sophist, a lover of wisdom. The Bible said, in whom is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Who is that in whom? In whom is hid all of the wisdom of, all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Who is it? So my friend, if you want wisdom, you really want to know the deep things of life? You want to understand what makes a man tick? Do you really care? Do you really care? Then you start looking at Jesus Christ. All right? And then there's that last one, thoughts. You don't take thoughts apart. Because they just come pop in, they pop in, they pop he says, you don't even take that much time with them. He said, what you do is just take them captive. When you take them captive, that means that you take them and you say, Lord Jesus, you can have this thing. Take it off of me. Shut up, Satan. You're a liar. Now, Lord, what was it you were saying? <laughs> You're in your prayer closet trying to talk to the Lord and some filthy thing pops into your mind. Don't tell me it hadn't happened. It has. Some distracting nothing, some garbage, some this, something that. So what do you do with it? You don't put any time in it. It's a fiery dart. Say, so Satan, you're a liar, or you just simply say, Jesus, I love you. Lord Jesus, you know where it came from and you know what it is. I love you, Lord Jesus. I love you, Savior. You just brought it captive. You just bound it up. Snatched it up and cast it away. And so it goes. The things that affect your life is the battle for your mind. And you're to put on the helmet of salvation and take the sword of the Spirit that I preached to you about last Sunday morning. You take that sword as a weapon to go against your enemy. You put that helmet on your head, the helmet of salvation, which is to protect your mind. If you let your mind just float out here free in this world and listen to every piece of garbage that's pumped into it, you will not know whether you're coming or you're going. But if you'll take the word of the living God... And do what the Bible says to do. Daily you'll find yourself growing. Daily you'll find your conviction stronger. Daily you'll, more, you'll understand greater what, you're, what you're, you're, you're standing on. Greater you'll understand the things of the Spirit of God. And as they grow inside you the wisdom and the knowledge of the Lord, then your Christian life grows and your soul grows. And sanctification begins to take place. And a separation is made. And you may not even be conscious of it at the time, but a separation is being made right. between what you really love and what you're about and your convictions and this lying, deceiving world. Good. And the only way it can happen is with the help of God. Yes. Have you been born again? Have you been born again? Have you grown any since you were born again? You can always tell you can always tell. You've been born again, no doubt about it. I know a lot of people have been born again. But let anything be said or done to them, and they're ready to quit, throw up their hands, and walk away from God. That's an indication right there. You may have a head full of knowledge, but you don't have a heart full of maturity. Father, in Jesus' name, use what I've said this morning, Lord. And we'll bless you and praise you and exalt your sweet name for who you are. I can't make myself grow, Lord. I can't grow myself. How can I do that? I don't know how to do that. But I can take your word and I can actively do what you said in your word. I can say to the philosophers of this world, you don't know what you're talking about. 
I can say to, to say to so-called science in this world, well, you're a fool, man. You don't have a clue. And then I can say to these darts, these fiery darts, these thoughts as they assault me, I can say, Lord Jesus, I know where that came from, and I still love you, Jesus. In thy holy name I pray. For Jesus' sake I ask it. Amen. Let's stand up and sing this morning. Page 329 in your all name. of glory. It's about Jesus. It's always been about Jesus. It's still about Jesus. It'll always be about Jesus. Brother Wilson, some of you ladies over there, pray this lady. Won't you come? Say, preacher, does Jesus love me? Yes, he loves you. He didn't die for an idea or for a doctrine. He died for people. He tasted death for men, mankind, men and women. Won't you come? Go ahead and sing another verse, brother. Come. They've got the Bible open over here. That means Christians are praying. The Holy Bible. The Word of God is quick. Did you believe that that's alive? Amen. There's a life in this book that did not originate on this earth. Those of you that like spooky things, <laughs> think about that. It's living. That's what it says. It's alive. I guess that's why men don't read it, huh? Scary. How many of you have ever been in some dog fight, some mess, some something, and just say, well, I think I'll just pick up the Bible, open it up, and go right straight to the place yeah. it starts talking to you? Because yeah. it's alive. It's even alive enough to know exactly where to go to when you open it. <laughs> I remember somebody the other day, I forget who it was. I don't know if I heard it here or somewhere. I hear so much stuff. But what they said was good. They said, I won't even lay anything on top of my Bible. Amen. Well, after I heard that, I started, I was working in my study, and I reached over there and started to lay something down there was the Bible, and I thought, no, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> it stuck. It stuck. I said, why? Because I respect that book. I respect it. It stuck. That was rebuked for me, and I took it. So consciously, I'm not going to lay anything on the book. Amen. Amen. Let's sing one more verse. Remember this, folks. We get impatient with people. You're trying to lead somebody to the Lord. That's all good. But the thing is, you're a human being. You get, you get impatient with people because it, it just didn't, you know. Well, what's wrong? Why can't you believe? That's not the way God operates. No, 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 no. He doesn't get in a hurry. He knows the very moment when you're ready. 
the very moment. The very moment. No. To that one who a thousand years is a day and a day a thousand years, do you think he gets upset over five or ten minutes or five or ten years? No. How many of you have ever felt that you have been moved and stirred by God but nothing happened? Think about it. Think about it. If he spoke to you and began to move in your heart and stir you and you felt that need for something spiritual. Folks, there's a lot of people that come to church who are just like a, a, a cow standing out here in the field. <laughs> a few years ago, I saw them come up to a cow and they were, had a disease and they took a rifle, 30-30 or something, and shot that cow and it dropped dead in its tracks. This cow standing next to it. That's the truth. I watched it. That's the truth. One cow drops dead and this one doesn't even stop chewing. That's what's called dull of hearing. But when God turns that hearing on, it's a different story then. It's a different story. And you see, the cow's a cow, born a cow, live a cow, die a cow, it's nothing, the cow's a cow. You're a man. That's right, brother. You are so much higher than a dog or a cow or a cat. So much higher. And with so much potential for what God has for you. Amen. Hallelujah to God. Amen. Well, they're still praying over here. Let's get one more verse. Then we'll let you go. I want to keep praying over here, this young lady. Some of you this afternoon, it'll be That's all it'll be. This went <laughs> But the word of God won't return void. <laughs> More of it might have gotten in here than you think. Well, I'm just the messenger. I'm not accountable for what happens. I'm the messenger. We'll have a word of prayer and let you go. God bless you. We'll be seated again this evening, six o'clock for the evening service. We encourage you in Wednesday night at uh, 7 o'clock's prayer meeting. And prayer, meet, prayer meeting over here at 5 o'clock this afternoon. Folks, get in those prayer meetings and pray. Meet with folks anytime you can like that and pray. That's good. Pray, pray. You can't, you can't pray too much. Pray. Amen. And I'll tell you right now, I don't know of a better friend you'll ever make than somebody you pray with. <laughs> you talk about a friend. That would be a good friend. All right, Brother Van Caldwell dismisses.